Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you that you're here to meet with us. There's not one thing he's going to leave undone in here today, okay? So know that. So the theme of today is born for such a time as this. You are born for such a time as this. You are not here by accident. The, the theme, the title of my message today is you are called to influence. You are called for influence. You are called to have influence in this world. That is our calling, all of our callings. I believe it's a strategic time on the earth to be alive in this hour on the earth. And I believe God is giving instruction in our hearts, in His daughter's hearts. And there's an army of women rising up on the rise to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the goodness of Jesus, the faithfulness of Jesus, to testify and bring Him glory. No, not a feminist movement, because there's a lot of those in the world. An army of women on the rise to proclaim the good news. Those are women that know who and whose they are, that are established in their identity as a beloved daughter, that are ready to be used for eternal purposes for His kingdom. Jeremiah 1.15, we know the scripture very well. We share it at baby dedications. But I wanna speak it over you today. And it says, before I knew you. God says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, He says, I set you apart and I have appointed you. Before you even saw the light of day and stepped into this world, He had holy plans for you. He has a destiny for you. He has a purpose for your life, a calling on your life. Your purpose and your calling is not linked to circumstances, where you come from, what's happened to you, because it was placed before you even entered this earth. He put it in you. And it will still be there when we leave this earth. It will echo on into eternity. Nothing in this earth can take that away from you. You are important. You have been born for such a time as this. Think about that for a second. doesn't matter where you come from, you've been chosen, you've been appointed, you've been set apart by the Father who loves you. God, our Father God looks upon you today and says you are beautiful and you are lovely. That's how he sees you today. You're his daughters, you are beautiful and you are lovely. And he beams with pride over you today. God is awakening his daughters today though. He's awakening us to a greater purpose than just us. And why we sometimes think we exist. It's not about us. It's always greater than us, what God has called us to. And today we're gonna learn from the life of Esther. Born for such a time as this, and we know that well. And we're going to learn from some of the preparation and the process Esther went through to saving her people and changing a nation. So I'm going to summarize her life in short. So we're not going to read through the whole book of Esther. I'm going to summarize it today for some of you who don't know the story of Esther. Esther was a young girl. She was an orphan girl 
living in a small town with her cousin Mordecai, who took her in after her parents died. When she hears the king is looking for a new wife, Esther was taken from her home and commanded to live in the king's palace and undergo 12 months of beauty treatments with myrrh and special spices and perfumes to beautify herself. And then spend one night with the king to see if he would like her enough to make her his queen. But because of God's favor, she was pleasing to the king and he chose her for his wife. Mordecai, her cousin, asked Esther to go to the king with a request to ask for her people's lives to be spared. She was known as Esther, queen of Persia. And she had been instructed to hide her Jewish identity to this point. Her real name wasn't even Esther, it was Hadassah. And if this had gotten out, it could have cost her her life. The decree to have all Jewish people terminated was the turning point in her life. It was her life and death moment, her crossroads. She could have cowered in fear and continue to be a powerless victim of her circumstances or step out in boldness and courage and become an instrument of deliverance in the hand of God to save a nation. She asked her people to pray and fast for three days and she said, I'll step out before the king and if I perish, I perish. And we know she did. And she saved her people. And she is probably one of the most well-known women in the Bible, aside from Mary. You see, we can look at women that we respect and admire and desire that, and desire the platform, the influence they have, the anointing they have. It can be admirable. It can be like, why don't I have that? So I want to talk to you today, and it's sometimes the thing that we don't want to talk about is the preparation it took to get there. What did it take to get to saving a nation? Esther did not accidentally or by luck or chance become the queen and saved a nation. It was a call, it was by design, it was strategic, and it was obedience. God is calling you today, daughter of God, to have influence. Esther had influence. She was a woman of influence. The meaning of influence is authority, weight, and effect. God is calling you to walk with authority, with a weight when you speak, that it will have an effect as you speak over circumstances. Influence is key to making a difference and doing something very important for God. Godly influence has nothing to do with your title. Where you come from, clearly, look at Esther. She was an orphan. She was no one well known in the city. But she became a woman of influence. You are called to have godly character also to sustain that influence and to protect you. We are all called with a special, unique call on our lives like no one else. It's unique. It's special. There's no one else in the world like you. But we are all called to walk in the same spirit as Esther did. We are all called to walk in the same spirit as Esther did. We might have a different outcome and different reasons and different purposes, but the same spirit as Esther. Esther carried with her a spirit of humility. She carried with her a spirit of submission. And she listened to instruction. She was obedient to the call. She responded. You see, 
Some of you are here today trying to figure out what, do, what am I called to do? Where do I fit? What is my calling? I want to tell you something today. You don't decide your destiny. You don't decide your destiny. God does. But you get to discover it. You don't decide it. You discover it. So my first point that I really want to speak on today is humility. I really think humility is the key to unlocking the other two, submission and obedience. Humility is the key to unlocking those two. Humility often we know is getting low, being meek. I believe it, I believe it means making room for Jesus. Not my will, but your will, God. It says in Psalm 25, 9, he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. It's a teachable spirit. There's a beautiful, beautiful explanation of humility. And it's the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word for humility is anava. Anava. Isn't that beautiful? Just even how it sounds, anava. Anava. It's a Hebrew word for humility. And do you know what it means? So beautiful. To occupy your God-given space in this world. Humility is to occupy your God-given space, your God-given identity in this world. We don't have to go around being brash and loud and arrogant just by being humble. We know whose we are. We know who our Father is. We do not have to shout. We do not have to show off. We can be humble. We can walk in humility. You are called to walk in humility, daughter of God. Walk in who God has called and redeemed you to be. I want to speak about something that works against humility in our lives. And often it's a spirit, because if humility is also walking in a spirit of humility, you're going to get attacked by a spirit. And the spirit that I really believe attacks humility is an orphan spirit. An orphan spirit will work trying to counteract humility. Matthew 16, 25, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, the fight against a humble spirit is an orphan spirit. An orphan spirit needs title. An orphan spirit needs position. An orphan spirit has a survival mindset because they don't know whose they are. They don't have identity. An orphan spirit is not humble. There is far too much fear of rejection and insecurity to be humble. An orphan spirit does not know their identity as a beloved daughter. You see, we're all here today in the room with the same father. We have the same father, the same heavenly father. Why then are there some walking around like an orphan and some walking around in authority as a daughter of God? Why? It comes down to revelation that you are his. It comes down to our identity, our identity as a beloved daughter, a relationship with the Father. James 4, verse 6, it says, He gives more grace. Therefore, He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Being proud 
works in the opposite of humility. Pride wants to sit on the throne of your heart. Pride wants control of your heart. Pride keeps you from being totally abandoned to God. It means you wanna be in control. Humility is formed in our dependence on God. A lack of humility in our lives is a primary reason we find submission so hard. Humility unlocks submission. Pride is the reason we don't walk in forgiveness. Humility is getting low. And no, no, it's not being a doormat. It's not being on the floor, in the corner with no voice. I can't say anything, I must just be humble. No, it's knowing your authority. It's knowing your authority. It's knowing that you're a daughter of God. It's knowing that you're accepted. It's knowing that you're approved. It's knowing that Jesus has gone ahead of you and before you and he's your real God. Humility is a heart condition. Humility keeps our hearts soft. Soft. The world wants to make your heart hard. He wants you to be the protector of your heart. He wants pride to sit on the throne of your heart. But Jesus wants your heart. He wants you completely abandoned to him today. Jesus, have it all. The good, the bad, the ugly. He wants to establish you today in who he made you to be. Humility, something else that goes with humility is honor. If you want to see if you have humility and you walk in humility, are you able to honor people? Can you honor your husband? Can you honor your boss? Can you honor those in authority? Can you honor your parents? It's gone quiet. <laughs> Matthew 23, 11 to 12 says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself, he will be exalted. We don't want to live our lives trying to exalt ourselves. We want God exalting us and honoring us and lifting us up. Because if you position yourself there, you're going to have to fight to keep the, yourself there. And it's going to wear you out. It's going to be exhausting. You're going to tire yourself out. We have to lose our reputation. There's so many of us in this room that are in this fight to keep up with the Joneses, to keep our reputation and our family name good. Let's not let that out the bag or this or that or the thing that's under the rug. We need to lose our reputation. Lose your reputation is walking in humility. Lose self-preservation. Stop trying to save yourself. Stop trying to elevate yourself. And stop trying to make yourself important. It's exhausting. Humility, humility is not putting on some fancy high heels and every bit of designer clothes that you own to go, I'm important. You might get some attention, but I don't think it'll be the right attention. What God is looking for is a soft spirit, a humble heart. He looks at your heart. He looks at your heart. In my life, the more I've given up of me, the more of him he gave me. Humility is getting our hearts aligned with his. Humility 
is walking in our identity as a beloved daughter, knowing whose we are. Something else about humility and walking in humility is forgiveness. Are you prepared to do the hard stuff, daughter of God? Are you prepared to do the hard stuff? And no, I'm not just talking about going through hard stuff. Because you can go through hard stuff and not come out better. You can come out bitter. Esther was someone that could have been bitter. She could have been mad. Lord, you've abandoned me. You've taken my family, my parents. I'm an orphan. Living in a small town with nothing. And now I'm forced to go into a palace and to see if someone wants me or doesn't want me. Am I not hurt enough? No, she didn't. She remained humble. She did not have a hard heart. She walked in freedom in her heart. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ already forgave you. You cannot walk in humility, in the spirit of humility, if you have unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart. It doesn't work. Your heart is entangled. Your heart is becoming hard. I want to share an example, something that me and Josh had to walk through in the beginning years of our marriage. And I don't think we were in ministry yet. Um... But anyways, it was something, I'm going to share the story because it's been resolved. So you don't need to freak out or anything, okay? <laughs> but at my wedding, there was some family things and some people fell out with each other and there were some disagreements and some people got offended. But then I got offended because I'm like, this is my wedding. And now you offended and now I must apologize to you for my wedding. I became mad. I was angry. And the Lord said to me and Josh, go and apologize. <laughs> Woo! And I remember I sat here, I was sitting in the service here, and it was in worship, and I couldn't even stand. I was just sitting there, I was mad. I was just mad, mad, mad. But in my heart, I'm like, Lord, if you're asking me to do this, I will do it. It doesn't mean I want to. It doesn't even mean my heart is right. But if this is what you're asking, I will do it. And at the time, it was people in authority over us. And now, they hadn't apologized. I actually felt like I needed to be apologized to So we worshipped. I went up to the people. By the grace of God. And by the time I got there, I'm like, Lord, you better give me the words. You better just do a work in my heart right now. And when I got there, God softened my heart. And I was able to apologize. I even cried. I just, like God just melted my heart. And he just removed that weed of bitterness from me. And I apologized. Even though I felt it was, we were kind of the injustice ones, you know, that it was done to us. I went and apologized. And I cried and I did it genuinely by the Spirit of God. And when I left and I walked out, I just had this sense. That was a taste. That was a test. And I just knew, 
at that time, I'm like, this wasn't for now. This was for the future. And God asked us to do that because he wanted to know, can you be trusted? Can you be trusted when I ask you to do something that's hard? But you know how good God is. He'll never ask you to do something and he won't honor you. And that was the beginning. We'd just been married. We were broke. We put everything into our wedding. Like we, we had nothing. We had debt. And we, there we were apologizing. We walk out. But I just knew. I'm like, it's okay. Lord, you know. You know all things. We get an SMS. Our bond owed us 100,000 rand. That day, as we left, and we needed that money, we were broke, 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 broke. But I was like, how good is God? And I don't know, like, I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't have happened if we, did, we weren't obedient. But God honored. He knew it was hard. He, he knew the circumstances from beginning to end, but it didn't matter. It's about the condition of our hearts. Sometimes people will not apologize to you. They will not repent. But you have to forgive. You don't have a choice in that. It's a condition of your heart. We don't have time and space for any unforgiveness or bitterness to be there. It has to go. Okay, my next point. <laughs> this is the word I think all women go, woo, submission. Woo! We're going to talk on submission today. Esther carried a spirit of submission to get under. To walk in submission can be very hard for your flesh. It's where our flesh has to die. And that's why we need to walk in humility first because we need grace. It says God gives grace to the humble. He gives you grace and then he goes, okay, now submit. Because you can't do it in your natural flesh, your natural abilities. It's hard. It's hard to our flesh. 1 Peter 5 verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submission, again, aligns us with God's order and his patterns for our life, for his blessing and favor to flow through to us. God does call for, for order. God is a God of order. He has patterns in the Bible for a reason. Because he wants to bless you. James 4.13, come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away in this earth. Instead, you ought to say, daughter of God, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But do not boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Submit your ways, your plans, your ideas, your life to the Lord. Stop telling God. Stop telling Him. This is where our flesh needs to die. Submit your life. Abandon yourself to him. Lord, what is it that you have for me? And so often it's bigger and greater than anything you could speak or imagine or think for yourself. 
we limit God. We limit Him by keeping it in our hands, in our control, with our will, what we think should happen this way, that way. Mm -mm. Unsubmission is self-righteousness. It's about you. Self-control. If you think you can work in an organization and fulfill the call on your life when you're unsubmitted to delegated authority or going to get a promotion when you trample on your husband, because it's a thing now, it doesn't go well. It's hard. It's exhausting. It's dangerous. We must understand the importance of maintaining a gentle, submitted spirit like Esther did. In the eyes of God, it allows us to be trusted with high honor. God has great influence for you, daughters of God. He has a great calling and a destiny on your life. And you do not need to fight for it. You do not need to strive for it. You do not need to prove yourself for it. You just need to know who and whose you are and walk in that spirit of humility and submission to the Lord. Esther modeled submission. Esther modeled submission by being teachable. Esther was always asking questions. How do you know if you are unsubmitted? How do you know if you're unsubmitted? You never ask questions. I like to be practical. How do you know you're unsubmitted? You never ask questions. It's where someone other than yourself, your thoughts, your opinions, can also have a say in your life. When last did you ask someone you love, how am I doing? Maybe even your children, how am I doing? Maybe even your husband, how am I doing? <laughs> If you're not married, your parents, your boss, how am I doing? Is there anything I can improve on? Ouch. Honesty can be the hardest thing to hear sometimes, but it does not mean we shouldn't hear it. Flesh dying is painful. It can feel like a tearing and it's hard I'm not gonna stand here and tell you it is not hard, it is hard. Submission works against your flesh and against the agendas and the ways of the world. It is scriptural, it is biblical, and it is the word of God. It's one or the other. James 4 verse seven says, therefore, Submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. What a powerful scripture. Submit to God and the devil will flee from you. When you are in submission to God, the rest of your life is ordered and the devil can do nothing about it. He loses all control. I think a really good example of unsubmission is the king's previous wife before Esther, Vasti. Queen Vasti. The reason Esther was able to step in was because Vasti was unsubmitted. The king called for his wife. 
and she refused to come. Do you know what she was doing? She was throwing her own woman's banquet on her own authority, through her own will. They say Vasti was very beautiful, naturally beautiful. After that point, when the king said, that's it, I need a new wife, is Vasti ever recorded or spoken of again, ever? She vanishes. You never hear of her again in all her natural beauty. Today, in our day and age, it could sound like this. I'm too busy. I'm busy with my priorities, my work, my, 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 whatever I think takes precedent. I'm busy. I can tell you now, those who cannot submit to their husbands do not submit to God. Plain and simple. Esther modeled submission in many areas of her life. She submitted to Mordecai first before she was married. That was her authority at the time because she wasn't married yet. And he had instruction for her and she submitted to him and listened. Honored. To the Lord, Esther, before she made a significant decision to go in front of the king, she prayed and fasted. She asked her people to pray and fasted. She submitted to the Lord. Lord, what will you do? What will you say? And then Esther submitted to her husband, the king. Esther, we speak of today, Thousands of years later, hundreds of generations later, Esther is still spoken of. There is still a celebration for the Jewish people called Purim, a two day feast of gladness and food and celebration for what Esther did. In her honor, thousands of years later, there's still a two-day holiday celebrating what she did. Wow. When God asks us to do something, it's never about us. It's generational. It's for your children. It's for your children's children. Never think it is just about you. Lastly, on submission, it's protection and it is a covering. 1 Corinthians 11.10 says, that's why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. It speaks of submission here, because of the angels. When you walk in a spirit of submission, to your delegated authority, your husband, whatever that looks like for you, the angels are activated. Because of the angels, there is a covering and a protection over you and your life and your household. I stand here today as a woman in submission. I don't stand here in my own authority. I wouldn't dare. I have a covering. I have a head covering, and that is my husband, that is the Lord, that is my husband. And he gives me his blessing to be here, to stand here, to deliver a word. I wouldn't dare stand here without it. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. You do not want to be in this world without a covering. You do not want it. Get under. Get under. Point three. 
obedience. Obedience. Esther obeyed and had a spirit of obedience to fulfill the call of God. It did not happen without her. She had to hear and then follow it through. Christ's obedience, Christ's obedience has released you today from the law to respond. Under the law in the Old Testament, women had no say. I could not stand here and speak to you today. But because of Christ's sacrifice and the finished work on the cross and His obedience, it has released us to stand up, to speak up and follow Jesus. It takes faith to respond. Many are called, and can I tell you now, each and every single one of you in this room are called by God. There's a calling on your life. But there's a scripture that says, many are called, few are chosen. Why many are called and few are chosen? Do you know what the difference is? The ones that are chosen are the ones that respond. The ones that respond. Many are called, few are chosen. It's the ones that respond that are chosen. We all have the opportunity. Stop waiting for the circumstances to be perfect. Some of you are waiting when the kids are at the house. Yes, when I get married, when I have enough money, when I get the job, when I get a car, when I do this, when I do that, when, 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 when. You're waiting for the perfect circumstances, for the right circumstances in your eyes, for God to use you. But it's our walk on the water moment. Do you know that all of us can walk on the water? Do you know that? If we were to wait for the perfect circumstance, the perfect weather conditions, and the water were to freeze over, <laughs> we can all walk on the water. But try and wait for that to happen. You'll be waiting your whole life, especially here in South Africa. When God calls you, do you think it felt nice around Esther at the time? Do you think it felt good? I need to go and risk my life right now. I could die in speaking to the king to save my people. Do you think it felt right? No. It felt hard. It felt scary. And there's times that God is going to call you up. He's going to call you out. And it's going to be scary. It's going to feel hard. It's going to feel like it's the right time. Stop it. Get your eyes on Jesus and step out in the water and walk to him. By faith. It's by faith. Eyes on Jesus with a conviction, with a life abandoned to God, to Jesus. Like Esther, if I perish, I perish, but I'm following you, Jesus. I'm coming after you. Something that I think that really stops people from following their call and what God's asking them to do is fear. It's fear. What conquers fear? It's love. Unconditional love. So again, it goes back to your identity. When you know whose and who you are, you know you're loved. And when you're established there, you're not gonna think twice about taking a step onto that water. We have to be established in that identity and that relationship with the Father. There's rest in obedience. You might think, oh, this is going to be hard. I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to have to do more. No, 
When God asks you to do something, he provides rest. But the opposite also works for disobedience. Burnout is spiritual disobedience. Burnout is spiritual disobedience. I want to read to you Hebrews 4, verse 4 and 6. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering rest, let us fear lest any of us seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And verse six, it says, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, since therefore it remains that some must enter rest. And to those whom it was, the, it was first preached did not enter because they disobeyed. It was because of spiritual disobedience. We need faith to enter that rest. We need faith to take a step onto the water to do the things that God is calling us to do. And there is rest there. God is not gonna put something on you that is ill-fitting, that is heavy, that is gonna sink you. He's gonna uphold you. He's gonna provide for you. He's gonna grant you rest. To be quite honest with you, I was actually quite confronted with this particular topic um, recently. Because I can tell you now, we can get busy as women. We can get busy doing the things that we think are righteous. This is good. And even with me in ministry, I'm like, I'm building the church. I'm doing it for Jesus to bring him glory. Busy, 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 busy. But we can, you can do it in vain. And how do we do it in vain? Is when we actually stop to go, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Because seasons change. And so the things that I was doing, I was supposed to do, but the season has changed. But I'm still doing those things, going, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I can't stop, I can't stop, because I'm building the house. I'm bringing Jesus glory, I've got to do it for him. This is righteous work. I was being disobedient. Even though I was doing a good work, I was being disobedient. And God got me to a place not so long ago where I had to just go, he just opened my eyes. And I was tired. I was tired. I'm like, this is exhausting. But it's not meant to be. It's meant to be restful. And what had happened is I was being disobedient. And I repented to God. I'm like, God, I'm so sorry. I never want to run ahead of you in your name, thinking I'm building the church and I'm not even listening to you. And I'm in a transitional season right now in my life. And I'm in a place because I got to this place where I'm just like, I'm laying it down. And then I'm going to pick up what you want me to pick up. I'm surrendering it, Lord, because I never want to run ahead of him doing what I think is important, making myself important. It's confronting. See, some of you today even feel righteous in what you're doing because you have your reasons for doing what you're doing. But just the most important component, the, the, the key, is this what Jesus asked you to do? Or is this making you yourself important? Burnout is spiritual disobedience. Somewhere along the way, I took it upon myself 
doing what I thought was righteous. The Lord doesn't want anything ill-fitting on you. He wants you to flow with him. He wants you in rhythms of grace with him. And that means being spirit-led and in the flow with him. And seasons change. Don't get stuck. Don't get stuck in a season that has passed. Keep hearing. Let him put instruction in your heart, even if it means something new. Even if it means laying down something. Even if it means picking up something. I don't know what it means for you. You have to hear the Lord for yourself. But it might not be what you want to do. That's where the submission comes in. Obedience is often a defining moment. A life and death, a crossroads. I really believe that Esther felt that. In that moment when Mordecai came to her and said, you need to go to the king. You need to tell him to not terminate our people. And at the time, the king hadn't called for her in 30 days, so she didn't even know whether she was out of favor with the king. And then she sent her people to pray and they fasted. But then she got to a place where it's like, you know what? If I perish, I perish. I'm going. And Mordecai said to her, Perhaps it is for this you have been born for. There was a defining moment in my life. And also, I just want to say what a defining moment is. A defining moment is an occurrence that typifies or determines all related events that are still to follow. A defining moment is an occurrence that typifies or determines all related events that are still to follow. A defining moment means there are still events to follow. A defining moment in my life was when I married Josh. And before we got married, I almost didn't marry him. I almost ran another path. And at that time, I worked at a very secular business, secular people around me. And then I had Josh now stepping into the ministry and I had this. And I think I was just in the middle. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I battled with my identity at the time. But I went to God and I'm like, God, what do you want me to do? I might have been torn between the three, but I was like, Lord, I actually want what you want. I want what you want. I'm distracted here, but I'm feeling like I'm meant to go this route. And I can tell you now, it felt like life and death. That's how it felt. You don't have these moments all the time in your life, but they are defining moments in your life where you get to choose. And I felt it. And I don't know what would have happened to me if I went down the other path that I didn't choose to go with Josh, but I felt death over it. I felt drawn to it, my flesh did. But I felt there was a presence, an evil presence there. But I was still drawn to it, because that was my flesh. The influences, my friends, they had opinions. Thank goodness I didn't listen to them. And I want to tell you why it was a defining moment. It wasn't because I married Josh. The defining moment was bigger than just a marriage. It was bigger than me just going, okay, God, I'm going to follow you. It was this Gracious Daughters was not a defining moment for me. That was. Because I would never be standing here today or Gracious Daughters wouldn't be called Gracious Daughters if I didn't make that defining moment. Because we all get a choice. We have choices in front of us. 
We have life and death in front of us in some defining moments where we get to choose. It means there's one or two or more choices, options. And maybe some of you are in a defining moment and you get to choose. Choice plays a major part in fulfilling our destiny. When there's choice, there's, there's a few things in front of you. But you need to hear the Lord's voice. That's where submission comes in. Not your will, but his will for your life. Never could I have known I would be standing here today. Never could I have known I could speak in front of people. I was a mess. I was drawling, I was drinking. Can you imagine? If you know, knew me then, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't. But his grace is sufficient. And he had a call on my life before I was born. And I don't know what you've been through in your life, but he doesn't change his mind. Because he didn't put it there because you did something good. He put it there before you even got into this world. And you, it's good. it doesn't change. He doesn't take it away. There can be delay. There can be detours. There can be unnecessary obstacles. And you know what? I'm humble enough to know that if I took that other route, there would still be a room full of women here, but it wouldn't have been me standing here. And that's what Mordecai said to Esther. If it is not you, God will raise someone else up. If, if I didn't say yes, it would have been someone else. But I'm grateful that I get to be in the room and be a part of it. When God asks you to do something, it's always bigger and greater. It's generational. Making small right choices daily, godly choices, can lead to great accomplishments. Something God might be asking you to do, and this might be your hard thing. It might be doing less. That's something for me. I can be a complete Martha. More, 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 more. I'm busy, 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 busy. The hardest thing for me to do is not to do more. I can do more. The hardest thing for me to do is to do less. It might even be being more present at home. Maybe God is asking you, some of you, to lay down your job and go home and be with your kids. And that is the hardest thing for you to consider. Why would He ask you to do that? There's a bigger reason and a bigger purpose and it's generational. Perhaps there's a calling on your child's life. Perhaps they're the next president. Perhaps they're the next pastor. Perhaps they're gonna birth the next move of God. But we're too busy. We need to hear what God is saying. Perhaps it's starting to do something. Perhaps it's starting to serve. Perhaps it's starting a business that you've been too fearful to step out and do. A ministry. Maybe it's even a connect. Perhaps it's even having that conversation with your boss that God's laid on your heart. Perhaps it's submitting to your husband. It might mean all of the three points I just spoke about. It might feel like correction. It might feel like some things are coming into alignment. Or it might mean today that God places an instruction in your heart today for something He's called you to do. And will you hear Him? Will you listen? Will you be open to what He's asking you to do? God is getting us in position, daughters of God. He is getting us in position, not because He wants to shut us up and keep us quiet and keep us at home. He is getting us in position to launch us out.
Psalm 68 verse 11 says, The Lord gives the command. The woman who proclaimed the good tidings, the woman who proclaimed the good news, the woman who proclaimed the gospel, you are a great host. That's what the Lord says of you and that is His command. You are a great host and He wants to use you. God's heart for you today is to soar, to soar like an eagle, to fly at very high heights because He needs you to have influence. But He cannot do that without walking in a spirit as such as Esther. Humility, submission, obedience is required because he's got great plans for you. God enlarges our territory without ever hurting us. He is never gonna give you something that'll hurt you, hurt your children, hurt your marriage, your health. He will never give you something that your character cannot sustain. You might have been concealed like Esther for a time period. They didn't know her real name. She was concealed. But there's a time coming that God is getting ready to reveal what He's placed inside of you. It's here, it's coming. And maybe you don't know what that is, but you're gonna discover it because He's ready to start revealing it because it's the hour on the earth for us to be used by God. We're in a season of preparation, daughters of God. We're in a season of preparation. We're in a season of preparation. God is getting you ready. Like Esther did, she had to go through a preparation. She went through myrrh and perfume and and a preparation to prepare herself for this defining moment. There is a preparing that God is doing in your life that is necessary. Because we all wanna be born for such a time as this, but we need to go through that preparation, that process, because God wants to bless you. He wants you to sustain. He wants you to have influence. He does not want it to hurt you. God is putting an instruction in your heart. Will you listen? He is calling for you to walk in the destiny He has planned for you. He is going to launch you out like an arrow that's being sprung out, piercing through the darkness. You're going to speak like a sword in your mouth as you speak, dividing soul and spirit through bone and marrow making a mark in this world and preparing the way for the next generation to come. That is what we are called to do. Isaiah 49, verse one to three, confirms it. The Lord says this over you, daughters of God. The Lord called you from the womb, from the body of your mother. He named your name. He made your mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of His hand, He hid you. He made you a polished arrow. In His quiver, He hid you away for a time. But He is saying to you, you are my servant Israel. You are my daughter in whom I will be glorified. You will be glorified through your life. I speak that over you today. He will be glorified through your life, through your obedience, through your humility, through your submission. He will honour you. He will bless you. He will cover you. He will give you rest. He will grant you favour. Grace is unmerited favour. When we walk in humility and it says, He gives grace to the humble, it's unmerited favour. That is our portion today. And I speak that over you today, daughters of God. You are His beloved 
highly favored daughters. And there's nothing he will not do for you. He has good, good plans for you. And in Jesus' name, not one thing will not come to pass in your life. No weapon formed against you will prosper. No obstacle, no distraction, no lie of the enemy will stop the call and the destiny He put in you before you entered this earth in your mother's womb. You are called to have influence. You are called to have influence. You are called to rise up and soar like the eagle. You are called to use your voice. You are called to bring Him glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can I ask everyone to stand right now? Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you're doing a work in our lives here today. This ain't no tea party. We've come here because there's work to be done. You're doing a work in our lives here today so that we can go out, so that we can minister to our families, our husbands, our kids, our workplace, our friends. Thank you, Jesus. I want to I wanna ask you in the room today, if you've heard this whole message and gone, yes, I feel like I'm ready. I want to do all of those things. But I don't believe I'm a daughter of God because I don't know Jesus and I've never asked Him to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And perhaps you're here by chance. Perhaps you just came. Perhaps someone else brought you here today and there's a stirring going on in the inside of you. There's a stirring. And it's tugging at your spirit. It's tugging at your heart today. And you're going, I need this. I want this. I want His plans for my life. I want Him to be Lord of my life. I need a Savior, but I don't know Him. That's what today is about. No one is gonna leave here today without knowing Jesus. If you do not know Jesus, this moment is for you. It is a God appointment. It is a defining moment. It's a crossroads in your life where you get to choose. So with every eye closed in this place, I'm asking you in this room, if that is you and you do not know Jesus, I want you to raise your hand right now. If this is your defining moment and you do not know Jesus and you do not know where you would go if you were to die tomorrow, if you are not certain, you raise your hand and we are gonna pray for you. No one is going home today not knowing Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you raised your hand, I want you to come to the front. I can't see, so I'm gonna ask you to be bold. I'm gonna ask you to be courageous. Just like Esther, come. We have all prayed this prayer before. You are not alone. We are sisters in this room. And all of heaven is rejoicing over you. Come to the Saviour. Come to Jesus today. He is here and He is here to meet you. He knows all about you. He knows all about you already. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are not here by accident. You are not here by accident.
This is a defining moment. This is an appointment with your Savior. This is where you get to meet your Father in heaven because Jesus tore every veil of religion, of sin, of shame, of condemnation so that today you can look, you can look up. You can look up and you can look into your Father's face. Do you know that He knows every number of hair on your head? He knows how many hairs you have on your head. There's nothing He does not know about you. Not one thing. The good, the bad, the ugly. He knows it all. And He loves you. He loves you. And in some of those moments in your life where you thought, I'm disqualified, that's me. That was the thing God saw, foresaw, when He sent His Son to the cross. He said, I'm going to redeem her there through my Son. That's why I sent Jesus to die for that moment. The time you felt abandoned, that's why Jesus hung on the cross. Some of you have been abused and you felt like God abandoned you. Jesus never abandoned you. In fact, that's what drove him to the cross. Some of you have been feeling, where was Jesus? Where was he? He was there. He saw everything. And that's what he saw when he allowed his body to be pierced and broken and whipped. He gave up his life because of that hurt, because of that pain, because of that abandonment. So today we're gonna pray a salvation prayer and invite Jesus into your heart. And your life is never gonna be the same, ever. Let's pray together. Everyone in the room, we're gonna pray with you. And I want you to repeat, I want you to open your hands. Open your hands. It's a sign of surrender. This is the posture of our heart today. Jesus, come into my heart today. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I acknowledge your finished work on the cross. It has redeemed me. I am forgiven. I am loved. I am a daughter of God. I'm chosen. I'm accepted. And I have a destiny and a calling on my life to bring you glory. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All of heaven is rejoicing over you, precious Lord of God. Let's give Jesus a shout.